Welcome to God, Sex, and You, a daily discipleship podcast on healthy sexuality. Here's your host, Purity Pastor, Dustin Daniels. Drink water from your own well. Share your love with only your wife. Why spill the waters of your springs in the streets, having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. Let your wife be a fountain of blessings for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She's a a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman or fondle the breast of a promiscuous woman? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does examining every path that he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. They are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die for a lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. King Solomon writes those words in Proverbs chapter 5, and those words ring so true as we continue our conversation with my guest, Dave Carter. Dave is a pastor, author, and counselor, and we are discussing his new book this week. It's titled Anatomy of an Affair, How Affairs, Attractions, and Addictions Develop, and How to Guard Your Marriage Against Them. In today's podcast, we'll discuss several things. Number one, why sex won't fix that God void in your life. Number two, We'll discuss a recovery exercise for marriages who have gone through an affair. And number three, what is a dangerous person in your marriage? And why does everybody have one? Today's show is titled, The Dangerous Person in Your Marriage. I I always kind of go back to that tells me that there's a void, there's a, there's a strain in the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ at that moment, if we're starting to yeah. do those kind of things. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there is an emptiness in that, and I don't think marriage will fit that God-designed void in your life. But it's very interesting, I think most of us, when we're walking with God, are very close to our spouse, and when we're close to our spouse, we love walking with God. I think it's a hand and glove thing. Mm. So one reflects the condition of the other. It's very hard to be really wildly in love with your wife or your husband and not be close to God. I mean, it's just, it's just a hand and glove thing. Mm. It was, it was built to be that way. Marriage in the first part of the Bible and at the very last chapter of the Bible throughout the church, Israel, everything is all about marriage. And the great thing about marriage is that, and most people, I don't think really, unless you're really studying like Ephesians five, is that our marriages reflect the heavenly marriage and the marriage yeah. of, of Jesus Christ as the groom. And we're the, we're the bride and yeah. we're supposed to have our marriages here on earth are supposed to reflect that same kindness and love and beauty um, that the Lord Jesus and the grace, goodness that, that he's given us day in and day well, out. You know. Yeah, and I even kind of get the impression from the water and the wine in the one marriage and also talking about the bridegroom, I get the, the impression that God loves that excitement. Mm. I can't wait to get my hands on you. <laughs> you know, that's, we, we kind what of cool that kind of stuff. But I will yeah. say this, Dustin, if you married somebody, you have all the infatuation for that person you need stored in your brain. And you need to find ways to rekindle it. It's there because people marry people they like for the most part. <laughs> right. Yeah. The biggest problem is not, it's not our spouse. It's, it's the no. guy that we're looking at in the mirror, right? I'm, yeah, I'm the biggest right. problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But the interaction between the two of you is huge. So, you know, I have a couple little exercises. I have my couples do recovering after adultery towards the end of the pro- recovery process. I'd be glad to share them with you if you think your listeners would enjoy doing some of those. Absolutely. Okay. So you, uh, each of you make a list. Each husband and wife make a list of your eight 
greatest experiences in your relationship from the time you met until where you are now. And they cannot be with any children present, and they can't be with any other couples present, and it cannot include your wedding day, and it cannot include the birth of your babies. Hmm. Okay? But it can include your honeymoon. So you make a private list. Each person does. And then you get together and you share it. Now, most couples will have four or five that match. And then let's give her a number. We'll say they have four. So she gets number five. He gets number six. She gets number seven. She gets, he gets number eight. Those are your eight greatest experiences in this marriage. And they are what held you together. They are what cemented you together. And you got in trouble because you stopped doing them. Well, you stopped doing what you do best. So you need to go back and repeat those. Now, I have a little statistic that I use to kind of encourage them because um, two, oh, so maybe three years now, the average cost of divorce in Orange County was $36,000. Okay, so you divide eight into 36000 You can spend $4,500 on each one of those eight experiences. <laughs> wow. And you still will wow. not have spent what it would cost you to get divorced. That is a great exercise. That's wonderful. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. They love doing it, too. Now, I've gotten phone calls from base camp at Mount Everest, one couple who <laughs> did that in college, to the wedding chapel on the Seine, to the top of Mount Whitney. Oh, I've gotten calls all over the globe from that kind of stuff. Let's make a transition here, Dave. I'd like to, to learn a little bit more about traits of a dangerous person and... Um, that, that word or that phrase, dangerous person, it just it gave me kind of a, an idea of, of what I thought you were talking about. But as I read your book, it, I, was, I wasn't on the same page with you. What is a dangerous person um, inside this marriage, and, and what are some of those traits? Well, uh, I, we talk about a dangerous partner profile, and when you say that, uh, people often think tall, dark, and handsome, or blonde and blue-eyed and beautiful or something like that. Sure. That's not what we're talking about. Most affairs, if you remember, first-time affairs have to do with comfort and distraction. So what this is still a work in progress. But I've identified after listening to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of couples over the last 40 years in this field, uh, some of what I call... Uh, vulnerabilities, and I spell those out. And, of course, the more of those vulnerabilities that are present in any one individual that you've come to know, that would probably be your dangerous partner profile. I think everybody has one. Everybody has a dangerous partner profile. And the more you know about who yours might be and what you're looking for in a relation, what you want or need, I think the better prepared you are. So here we go. When I teach uh, seminary students, I, I have all my male seminary students construct their dangerous partner profile. Wow. I talk about it in small groups. That's a great idea. It's That's amazing. a great idea. <laughs> okay. First of all, we talk about developmental lag, okay? Uh, where maybe you uh, haven't really grown up as much as you or at the right pace that you should have. And we'll hear wives talk about things like, uh, I got four kids, three of them are under 10, one's 35. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, so uh, th there is a developmental lag, and uh, oftentimes affairs are focused on meeting developmental lag, satisfying the uh, undeveloped part of the individual. We'll talk more about that. It sounds a little confusing, but it really makes a lot of sense. Personality style. We all have certain personality styles that we like, that we feel attracted to, that we admire. Maybe they're not the kind of person's. We married, but we always kind of get caught up in somebody who's a little different or maybe more like this or that. Uh, hobbies and interests are an immediate attraction. When you find somebody that shares a hobby or interest with you and your spouse doesn't share it, uh, that's something that you will find fascinating. If I had time with you, I could tell you all kinds of stories about mm, that. Wow. Uh, an attachment pattern. Uh, maybe you grew up with a single mom who was didn't have a lot of time to cuddle and spend time with you because she was busy putting food on the table for three kids after being abandoned by her husband. So you would love to be 
cuddly. You would love to be connected. You would love to be close. But you married somebody from Minnesota, and they never show affection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So uh, there's an, there is that attachment pattern that you yearn for or maybe missed or your spouse can't or won't or doesn't provide. Maybe in a family of origin uh, where you share things uh, maybe you're even unaware of things that happen in that family that predispose you to somebody of a shared experience. For instance, you grew up in an alcoholic family, and uh, you you find somebody. Oh yeah, I know what that's like. I had a yeah, my dad was an alcoholic too, or my mom was a closet drinker, and you'd be surprised how many people find somebody to have an affair with who has a shared story of a family of origin. Uh, it, hmm. It's just oh, I could I could tell you some unbelievable stories. I, I'll tell you one. I got a phone call. I never met this guy, Dustin. He calls me up one day. He, he's uh, three thousand miles away from me, and he said, "Dave, I want to tell you a story." He said, "I'm a pastor, and uh, I uh, met my wife in uh, um, actual college. So she came from a very difficult family background." And uh, but she was discipled uh, in high school. She came to Christ, and then she got in a great youth group. And uh, then she got into college, and she went through a, a, a college uh, mentoring program that was really helpful to her. And uh, I met her at that point in time, and we were leaders in this college group. And uh, then uh, we we went on. We, we fell in love. We started dating. We went off to seminary. We finished seminary. We went into ministry. And uh, in our first church. Uh, you know, we had a couple of children, and she was very busy with them, and she wanted to get back into ministry, and she just couldn't because she was too tied down at home. And our church happened to be in a town where there was a prison, and they started writing the prisoners in our church to kind of encourage them, et cetera. And uh, she got involved in that ministry and didn't have to leave the house, and she was thrilled with the opportunity. And uh, I'll tell you, Dave, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I came home from the church, and uh, there was a note on the table that my wife told me she had fallen in love with the prisoner she had been contacting, and oh he came by and picked her up, goodness. and she's gone. She left me with wow. four kids. I have never seen her since. Okay. Now, that family of origin that involved chaos, abuse, molestation, when you become a Christian, you drag that hurt with you, and it will set you up. And he told me, he said, I, I'm a very steady guy. I'm I'm sure I'm dull and maybe even boring compared to her family of origin. But I certainly never anticipated this. So that's what that's all about. Wow. Marital void and emptiness. We've already talked a lot about that kind of stuff that you wish your spouse would do this or that with you. You know, my wife's musical. Oh, I could tell you stories about this. My, <laughs> my wife is very musical. Me, I'm not. My wife's a dancer. She was born to dance. I can't. We used to take dance lessons on cruises. I, it was ruining all of our cruises because I was dreading taking the dance <laughs> lessons. Oh, goodness. Okay. So, uh, I feel, I feel the same way, Dave. I've been asked not to sing anymore. I can't even worship in, in the house. She goes, can you stop? I mean, really? I'm like, really? I'm that bad? Great. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's, I, I tell her, one of these days, babes, one of these days I'll be perfect, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then there's a pursuit pattern where, you know, uh, maybe you're the one that's the big caregiver and you always wanted somebody to take care of you. And uh, it, it just goes back and forth. Who's in charge? Uh, I could tell you again stories about this kind of stuff. And then internal age. We all have an internal age that fluctuates dramatically according to the people we're around. And uh, it, it changes all the time. And, and that's a very interesting question to think about. How old are you on the inside? So, hmm. so that, that, those are the, what we call the eight characteristics, at which they're not just singular characteristics, but they're categories that you need to be aware of in your particular life. My son, obey your father's commands and don't neglect your mother's instruction. Keep their words always in your heart. Tie them around your neck. And when you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they'll protect you. And when you wake up, they will advise you. For their command is a lamp and their instruction is a light. 
their corrective discipline, ah, that's the way to life. It's going to keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a promiscuous woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you, for a prostitute will bring you to poverty. But sleeping with another man's wife, that will cost you your life. Can a man scoop flames into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with the man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished. King Solomon writes those very sobering words in Proverbs chapter 6. And tomorrow we'll continue our conversation with Dave Carter and his book, Anatomy of an Affair. Tomorrow we'll hear an amazing story about one man that learned about himself as he went through this dangerous person profile exercise that Dave talked about today. Well, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and, and Happy New Year coming up. This is the time of year, I know, where everybody, every ministry on the face of the planet is, is asking for money. And you know what? If, if God nudges you to make a year-end donation, I, I pray that you would consider God, sex, and you. Um, you're listening to this podcast for a very specific reason. And um, I pray that we are a blessing to you, your family, your children, and your church. And not only are we reaching you, but we're reaching um, a lot of other people listening in 80 countries around the world. And our goal is to continue to spread this message of purity through the gospel. And we want to reach those other 80 countries. So I pray that you would pray about helping us, coming alongside of us, praying for us, and also um, becoming a purity partner with us. And that is simply a dollar a day to keep this podcast on the air. And you can do that by visiting the website at dustindaniels.org and just click on Give. Well, thank you so much for listening to God, Sex, and You. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Purity Pastor. You can email me your questions. I would love to respond to those at DustinDaniels.org. Jesus says that blessed are the pure in heart, for they're going to see God. This unveiling, this purging of the depravity and the sin in our own life, in our heart, God does that on a daily basis. And the result of the walk, no matter how hard it is, uh, you just keep doing this over and over. You keep showing up on a daily basis and you are going to see God. What a cool, what an amazing, amazing revelation. Walk worthy today, my friend, as you cling to Jesus. If you're married, cling to your spouse Look at her, look at him in the eyes today and, and just let them know how much you appreciate them and how much you love them. If you have children, tell them you love them. Tell them about Jesus and, and the story of Christmas, that this is not about Santa Claus. This is about our Savior who has chosen to reveal himself from heaven to be born of a virgin. And then he shows us how to live. He shows us how to die and, and he makes all things new. And what a beautiful story that is. Ah, oh, I love you. And I look forward to our time again tomorrow. Tomorrow.